Good evening, good evening, Pastor Daniel Dagan here, Hope Apostolic United Pentecostal Church. Welcome you here to our live Bible study. We've been teaching here on Thursday nights last week, and now this week we've been teaching on understanding the three different categories of tongue speaking in the Bible. Understanding three different categories of tongue speaking in the Bible. And we want to get started again tonight with this lesson. It's 7 p.m. here on the East Coast. And I just want to remind you, as a couple more coming on, that we will be teaching tomorrow at 1 p.m. We'll be teaching tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, same Facebook page, on part two of the lesson on the Antichrist, taking a biblical look at the Antichrist. And then also tomorrow, Lord being our helper, we'll get into talking about the false prophet, the second beast of the book of Revelation. So we welcome you here to our home. Many of you have been with us uh, since mid-March, late March or so, doing these online Bible studies. I pray it's a blessing to you. I greatly appreciate your prayers, your encouragement, your comments. I love to see where you're watching from. Um, it's just a unique thing, but I love to see what people's watching from, and we welcome you here to this Bible study. So I would like to ask you to join me to pray, and we'll get into the Word of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you, mighty God, for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you, God, for your love and your kindness. Lord God, that you would touch every person tonight, God, that's watching. Lord God, that you would release revelation of thy Word. God, rebuke every foul spirit, God, every spirit unlike thee. Help us to teach, God, in a pure spirit. Help us to teach with humility, but yet to teach thoroughly and let us teach plainly. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy and your kindness. Be exalted in all things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. Can I have an amen from somebody? <coughs> so we want to begin tonight. I've been teaching here for a couple different weeks on what I call three different categories of tongue speaking in the Bible. I taught extensive lessons. You could go back a couple of Thursdays ago and you could watch them. I taught an extensive lesson on what I would call the first category of tongue speaking in the Bible. Each of these have many different Bible references associated with them, both prophesying, pointing to the time in which they would happen, and then, of course, in the book of Acts and into the epistles, the literal occurrences. The first one is when somebody receives the Holy Ghost, is born of the Spirit the first time. Thereafter, as a sign, they will speak in other tongues. We talked extensively about that. Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19, other references. The second category of tongues speaking in the Bible is for that same person. As they begin to grow in their walk with God, they begin to mature. John Smith comes to God, begins to repent of his sins, <clears throat> turns from his sins, has faith in God, filled with the Holy Ghost with the sign of tongues, water, water baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and then he is now Holy Ghost filled believer. Well, he begins to develop a prayer life, second category of tongue speaking in the Bible. The prayer life or the prayer language of tongues for the believer. We taught extensively upon that on a Thursday night. Go back and watch a couple of Thursday nights ago. And, and then we finished that element of it last week. It's the prayer language of tongues. In the midst of that, what's the purpose of that? In the midst of that, the believer, as they pray in the Spirit, I taught this previous, but let me just emphasize it one more time. As they pray, they should pray for things that they know about. Scriptures admonishes that. If you have a friend, Mike Doe, and he's having marital problems, he's told you at work, I'm having marital problems, please pray for me. Well, you know that in your cognitive mind because he told you. So you would pray over that. You have not because you ask not. When we come to God in prayer, we should petition him. Let a request be made known unto God. But then there will be points in which you feel a burden for prayer, the Spirit of God moves upon you to pray, but you don't have anything on your list to pray over. But you just feel directed to pray for that preacher. Who was he again? I can't even remember his name. But I feel pressed to pray for him. Well, that's the Spirit 
of intercession many times. You begin to pray in the spirit in tongues and you're praying for things you don't know about. We taught a previous lesson on that. Another point of the believer praying in the spirit is for personal renewing, personal strengthening, personal edification. We talked previously on that, the second category of tongue speaking in the Bible, yea, the prayer language of the believer for the purpose of intercession and then also for personal renewing. Now we talk about the third category of tongue speaking in the Bible. It is in teaching, and I say this humbly, not trying to be boastful or arrogant. I'm not trying to uh, you know, celebrate anything that we've done, but in teaching thousands of home Bible studies in 29 years of ministry, in teaching thousands of home Bible studies in a lot of different settings, you name it, we've probably been in that setting teaching a home Bible study. I say that very humbly. But there's, there's many uh, common questions that tends to come up, probably 30 of them, that tends to come up over and over and over and over. Well, one of the common questions that comes up, or one of the common points of confusion for people, when you begin to talk to unsaved people, new believers, or people of different persuasions about Acts 2.38 salvation, repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues. When you begin to speak to people about that, <clears throat> many times, what's come up in my experience many times is people are confused about 1 Corinthians 14. There's a confusion about that. And I've heard many preachers, many, many preachers. I have no stones to throw. I'm not going to call out anybody's names. That's not who I am. But I've heard many preachers take <clears throat> all tongue speaking in the Bible and lump it into 1 Corinthians 14, yea, the gift of tongues and interpretation. It's dead wrong. It's absolutely wrong. That does not stand up to biblical scrutiny. Go back and study the previous Thursday nights, the last two or three, and I dealt with the two previous categories of tongue speaking. Tongue speaking, when a new believer gets the Holy Ghost, the prayer language of tongues, yea, tongue speaking, praying in the Spirit for the believer, be it for intercession's purpose or for the purpose of personal renewing. Now we talk about the third category of tongue speaking in the Bible. Amidst the nine gifts of the Spirit, can you go with me? 1 Corinthians 12. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 12, chapter 1. As you turn there, please have your Bibles. We're going to dig into it. You know, I got mine open. We're going to be digging into it. Uh, this is a Bible study. It's not uh, a study of my opinion or my ideology or what my particular organization or denomination believes, but it's a Bible study. Okay? 1 Corinthians 12, as you turn to chapter 12, verse 1. Let me just again review the background of the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church is a church that, again, God's done wonderful things in them. They've come out of darkness into light, been baptized in Jesus' name. Go back and study. Acts 18 into Acts 19, the great revival. When Paul comes to Corinth and he is um, and he's also um, strengthened and aided by Aquila and Priscilla. And God gives that city, that port city of Corinth, a great revival. Many people come into the fold, okay, and they're born again. And we have thus a church that is birthed and established in the city of Corinth, i.e. the Corinthian saints. Paul writes a letter back to them. Well, as it is with every person in every city, there's particular dynamics and strongholds and personalities in every church and every community, just like with every believer, strengths and weaknesses. Well, the Corinthian weakness was, among others, they were very sensual. They came behind in none of the spiritual gifts. They excelled in the spiritual gifts, but they seemed to lack character. They didn't excel in the fruits of the Spirit. They didn't really excel in the nine Beatitudes, but they excelled in the nine spiritual gifts. They came behind in none of the gifts. Okay, in addition to that, there were some real carnal fleshly issues in this body of Corinthian saints. They were trying to step outside of the laws of God, yea, the church, and take one another, literally take brothers in the household of faith to court to resolve matters or disagreements. There was also some sexual immorality and just a lot of things. So that's some of their weaknesses. But then they had this other thing. They were, they were fascinated by Greek culture. They came out of that. They were fascinated by Greek culture. And, and it's, um, it's very important to understand that the Greek culture 
was drawn to or lured by or mesmerized by the ability to speak like the gods, the ability to speak with power. And Paul didn't really have that. He says, I come not with enticing words, but demonstrations of the enticing words of man's wisdom, but I come with demonstration of the spirit and the power. So when God moved upon him, he spoke as the oracle of God. Yes, he spoke with a powerful anointing, but in terms of being a gifted orator or just public speaker, if I can say it like that, he was not that guy. The scripture says he spoke with contemptible speech. Apollos was a powerful speaker. Apollos was a great godly minister after he comes to Christ, Acts 18 and the 19. But he was a powerful speaker. The Corinthian church tried to divide themselves on who baptized you. Did Apollos baptize you? Did Paul baptize you? So there were some real struggles in the Corinthian church. Beyond the fleshly carnal, they were mightily used by God in the gifts of the Spirit, very sensitive to the Spirit. And I also think some of that's probably tied to the background that they had, but they, they lacked character. They were fascinated, drawn into this ability to speak, speak like the gods. And that is a backdrop of the problem that leads us up to 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. You cannot study, <clears throat> you cannot study 1 Corinthians 14 in a vacuum. That's a problem a lot of preachers make, frankly speaking. They'll, they'll cherry pick messages and verses and they study them in a vacuum or they try to build a concluding doctrine upon a passage without considering how it ties into other places in the Bible and the greater broader view of that passage. Go to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and 14 is, is it's an exposition on spiritual gifts. Okay, the conversation starts in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1. That's without refutation. Any commentary you pick up on the Bible is going to affirm to you what I just told you. It picks up in verse 1. And Paul begins the language, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you be ignorant. So he is addressing a church that he founded by the grace of God with the Quill and Priscilla's assistance, with the Paulus's assistance. He's addressing that church in this epistle. And he's addressing saints of God that are filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name. And he says, you have to hear it. He says, I would not have you ignorant. Ignorant concerning what? Ignorant concerning the Sabbath? Ignorant concerning circumcision? No. Ignorant concerning spiritual gifts. So in lieu of the Corinthians wanting to speak like the gods and trying to exhibit that ability or skill, they have now crossed lines. They have done things that are out of order. They have done things to bring a word of correction to them. And specifically in their efforts to operate in the gifts of the Spirit, Paul has observed, heard, discerned, seen. It's come upon him. The cares of the church has come to him. And, and, and he is aware of this problem. So now he writes and he is addressing it to the Corinthian church. So he's trying to clarify that. And the epistle is written on that backdrop, him giving a word of correction. Okay, now we jump down verse 8 down to verse 10. Uh, I'll just quickly touch it. Here, verse 8 to 10, 1 Corinthians 12, lists the nine gifts of the Spirit. And it says, For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, to another by the same Spirit, to another by the same Spirit, the gift of faith, by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing, by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. So nine gifts of the Spirit. This, this thought, this gift of the Spirit called prophecy, and then tongues and interpretation. Those are the three that come forth as the speaking gifts. That's particularly what the Corinthian church was fascinated with. How can I say that? Just because I think it? No. When you read what Paul addresses by nomenclature, by wording, by verbiage, in 1 Corinthians 14, he specifically deals with those three. And that's, that's logical. 
prophecy, tongues, interpretation, because that is a speaking element of those nine gifts of the Spirit. Okay, one section deals with the knowledge of God, one speaks with the power of God, one is a speaking element of God. Okay, prophecy, tongues, interpretation deals with how God speaks to a group or to a congregation. And that's where the Corinthian church has made missteps. And that's what Paul is dealing with now. So now we continue on. Notice what it says, 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 31. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 31. Are you with me? Can I have an amen? It says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28, And God had set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, miracles, gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversity of tongues. Stop the tape. Verse 28 is a unique verse because it blends together elements of the fivefold gift ministry, apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, found in Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. It blends together some, some, of the nine gifts of the Spirit that we just read about in the same chapter. And then it even touches on what I would call some of the service gifts, the nine service gifts, seen in Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, about verse 6 down to about verse 12 or so. Uh, the service gifts lifted their helps, governments, that's some of the service gifts. Okay, lesson for another time. Uh, verse 29 of 1 Corinthians 12, Paul asked the rhetorical questions. Is every saint, yea, are all apostles, all prophets, all teachers, all workers of miracles? Do all have the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpretate tongues? So in the context of gifts and talents, yea, the nine gifts of the Spirit, tongues, interpretation, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, prophecy, healing, miracles, discerning the spirits, gift of faith, in, in the context of the nine gifts of the Spirit, in the context of the fivefold gift ministry, apostle, pastor, prophet, teacher, evangelist, in that context, he's asking, is everybody an apostle? Does everybody have the gift of the work and the miracles? No, they don't. Now, any sin of God that avails himself to the things of God I believe certainly can be used by God in the gifts of the Spirit, but for different reasons. Many are called, few are chosen. Many people potentially have a desire for these things, but they're not willing to really understand them, study the scriptures on these elements, and not really prayerful. They're not given to fasting and consecration. And for that reason, they don't operate in the gifts of the Spirit. They don't operate in the realm of the miraculous. It's not to say that God doesn't love them, but some people just never get to that place. That's the point he's making there. He's not teaching against tongues. He's not teaching against um, uh, people not operating in the miraculous. What he's saying is that everybody doesn't have the gift of tongues and interpretation. The gift of tongues and interpretation. That's what he's saying. Verse 31, then he highlights it, and it's kind of a summation of chapter 12. Covet earnestly the best gift, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. So he tells them to covet earnestly, desire deeply the best gift. What's that? What's the best gift? In the context of the nine gifts of the Spirit, he listed in the same chapter. Hmm, is faith greater than this? Miracles, is the gift of healing greater than discernment? Is discernment greater than the gift of faith, greater than the word of knowledge, greater than the word of wisdom. What's the greatest gift? Well, certainly faith operates all of them, but the best gift or the greatest gift is the one that's needed at the time. The one that's needed at the time. If somebody needs healing in the body, they don't probably need a word of knowledge. They don't probably need a word of wisdom, but they need healing in the body. So the best gift, desire the best gift, pray for the best gift. Part of that is discernment being able to be sensitive to what's needed in the moment, what's needed in the moment. So there's a lot more I could say there, but let me keep moving. And then he, he gives them this statement at the end of verse 31 that he will show them a more excellent way, a more excellent way. Well, he gets into the very next statement. He says in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 13, he says, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, though I speak with the tongues of men, and of angels have not charity, 
I became as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Charity is also translated in other renderings of the Bible uh, in verse 1, 1 Corinthians 13 as love. Love. It's the love chapter. So it's great to be used by God in the gifts of the Spirit. It's great to speak in tongues. He never teaches against speaking in tongues. He does teach the proper use of it and the proper use or application of tongues and interpretation. But above all, he emphasizes love. Let everything be done in love, in love, in love, in love. And then we continue on. Let's dive now into head and shoulders. Let's dive into 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I pray you have your Bible. Uh, take notes, highlight. If you have any questions, please email them to me and I'll address them in the next teaching. Pastor Dagan at gmail.com. They may just come up in the teaching tonight. But um, if they don't and you email me a question, I'll make sure I address it next week. Um, if you want to give me an amen, that's good to give the preacher an amen. So 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 14, and we go into it. Notice what it says. Verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 14. Follow after charity, love, and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. So he emphasizes desire spiritual gifts gifts. So he's teaching in the context of spiritual gifts. And he lists them. If there's any question, he lists the nine of them in chapter 12, verse 8 to 10. And then he tells them to desire spiritual gifts. He's the great teacher. He's not trying to extinguish the spiritual fire to be used by God in spiritual gifts. He opens up the chapter with telling them to desire these things. But you need to, in all you're getting, get an understanding. Okay, you need to understand how they're going to be used. In the midst of a young believer's passion to be used by God in the gifts of the Spirit, in the midst of a young minister desiring to be used by God in the gifts of the Spirit, I would tell them the first thing to do, check your spirit and make sure it's not pride. Number two, why do you want to be used? Number three, Focus on the nine fruits of the Spirit more than you focus on the nine gifts of the Spirit. Number four, desire to be used in the gifts of the Spirit. Number five, study and understand the gifts of the Spirit. That would be what I would tell that young believer, that believer, or that minister that desires to be used in the gifts of the Spirit. So he tells them to desire spiritual gifts. But then he does seem to emphasize prophecy. Prophecy, when you talk about it in the context that we're dealing with here, it is, uh, there's two levels of prophecy in the context of 1 Corinthians 12 and chapter 14. It's this. The first level of prophecy, the gift of prophecy, is simply to speak words of exhortation and edification, to uplift. You've heard people do it. Preachers get up and, and the message basically when it's over, it's a good message, it's a sound message, it's a Bible message. But when it's over, the thrust of it has been to encourage and to uplift. I preach messages like that sometimes. God just sometimes will lead the preacher, the pastor, the guest evangelist to uplift the body. And it's needed, it's needed, it's needed, it's needed. And, and that is flowing in the gift of prophecy. Sometimes a singer may in the midst of introducing a song, share words of exhortation. A, a testimony leader, a worship leader may share words of exhortation. And you may receive it simply as a testimony. But really, at times what they will do, they will step into an anointing. And there will be a flowing of the Spirit. And there will be a manifestation of the gift of prophecy. So the gift of prophecy, a lower dimension of that, lower level of that, is simply speaking words of exhortation or edification, but then a more developed, a more developed element of the gift of prophecy, and you, you develop and you graduate from faith to faith. Okay, you strive for mastery. A more developed element of the gift of prophecy is to be able to literally speak to specifics, to speak to the uniqueness of a situation. And discernment's tied to this, and word of knowledge overlaps it a little bit, but to speak 
specifically to a situation. And then the office of the prophet is able to prophesy things that are foretelling and then also even discern, discern and begin to see things and that gets some into dreams and visions. So that's a basic overview. So he tells them to uh, desire spiritual gifts, but rather to prophesy. It does seem like, it does seem like that there's an emphasis here, that there's an emphasis here upon prophesying. And there seems to be a greater, a greater emphasis here upon prophesying, even above tongues and interpretation, even above tongues and interpretation. So I think that's very interesting there how that is done. So you'll notice as we continue reading, I'm going to go verse by verse. But when you get into verse 4 and verse 5, you see the highlighted emphasis upon prophesying. And let me just prelude verse 5 and say tongues and interpretation. Tongues plus interpretation equals to prophecy. Those things equal to each other. Equal to each other. And as I go through this, you'll see that. But it does seem like in his address here to the Corinthian church, that the prophecy should be the thing that they're focusing upon. Be it if it comes through the coupling together of tongues and interpretation, or if it simply is somebody standing up in an orderly fashion under inspiration of God, they speak a word of prophecy. It seems to be that is what Paul is admonishing this congregation to do moving beyond just randomly, sporadically doing what they want to do, but begin to do it in an orderly fashion, spirit-led, under the authority of the congregation, the elder of the church, but then seek to move beyond just randomly speaking out in tongues. When we get deep into this passage, it's clear that there was not just one or two or three that was trying to stand up and give a message of tongues. It was happening almost in an out-of-control fashion. So Paul's trying to bring them into a place of understanding where the ultimate goal would be to prophesy, yea, for the purpose of exhortation, edification, everything be done, being done the right way, being done the right way. So can I have an amen from somebody? If you're with me here, can I have an amen from somebody? Good to have you with us tonight. I see several of you on with this here. So we go on into verse 2, In the verse 2. Um, now, also, 1 Corinthians 14, the entire chapter, verse 1 to 40, you can't take all 40 of those verses and just blanketly uh, scribe them to and assign them to the third category of tongues speaking in the Bible, which is tongues and interpretation, two of the nine gifts of the Spirit, and say all 40 verses automatically apply to that. That would not be correct. Okay, I'm going to go through and I'm going to explain it to you and I'll give you the reasons why. Every verse does not absolutely directly apply in principle application to the gift of tongues and interpretation. Okay, why did I say all of that? Because in 1 Corinthians 14, there's some comments made that Paul makes about uh, intercession and how the Spirit flows through us with the gift of tongues as it is married to or part of our prayer life as a Holy Ghost filled believer. He'll touch on that a couple of different times. Well, that those references go into um, explanation of the praying in the spirit and intercession. And then there's many references that deals with the course, tongues and interpretation and the gifts of the spirit. So how, how do I say that? Why do I say that? What gives me the latitude to make that interpretive conclusion? This is what gives me the latitude. The Bible interpretates the Bible. And you can take these verses and overlay them with the other references on the same subjects, prayer language intercession, and they fit perfectly together. They almost say the same thing. So, and you can feel a break when you read through the text, you can kind of feel a break or transition at different places. Stay with me now. Stay with me. I'm getting into the deep weeds now. Um, but uh, it says here in verse two, for he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, how be it in the spirit, he speaketh mysteries. Stop the tape. Okay. That applies to first the prayer language of the believer. Remember Romans 8? We talked about it last week. Romans 8, 26, 27. We don't know what we should pray for, but the Spirit maketh intercession through us. Paul, later in the same chapter, 
uh, verse 15, 16, he speaks of praying with an understanding, your native tongue, language, your, your principally learned language, and then praying in the spirit in which you don't understand. Well, that, that's all dealing with the prayer language or intercession of believers. Okay, whenever you're praying in the spirit, what happens? You don't know what you're praying about. Okay, verse 2, for he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. So by biblical definition, Romans 8, 1 Corinthians 14, 2, 1 Corinthians 15, 16, by biblical definition, when you're praying in the spirit, you don't know what you're saying, okay? And, and that, that blows out of the water. That refutes the whole errant conclusion that some people have about Acts 2. When they were filled with the Holy Ghost the first time they spoke in tongues, it was not their prayer language. It was a sign that they had been filled with the Spirit. And it becomes the measuring rod. Later in Acts 11, later in Acts 15, there's references back to as it was in the beginning, as the Gentiles were measured. And, and it became the measuring rod. They spoke in tongues. They received the Spirit like we did. Well, some people in, in error say that Peter and them were speaking in tongues because God miraculously gave them the ability to speak foreign languages so they could preach the gospel to other people and they could go around preaching the gospel in different languages. Wrong, wrong, wrong. That's not what happened. Because I, I taught on this a couple of weeks ago, but when Peter stood up, he wasn't speaking in tongues. He went back to speaking his natural dialect. Likewise, when you speak in tongues, people don't understand you. I just read it. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. When you speak in tongues, you speak not unto men, but unto God, is what your Bible says. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. So again, when you're praying in the Spirit, you don't have an understanding. That's consistent with 1 Corinthians 14, Romans 8. And, and then you're praying in the will of God. Okay, you're praying the mysteries, the will of God, things you don't know about. That's a very significant verse. Very key verse. Let's continue working here. Verse 3, 1 Corinthians 14. Are you with me? Are you taking notes? Please stay with me. I've been asked about 1 Corinthians 14 more than any passage in the Bible when it comes to tongues, praying in the Spirit, receiving the Holy Ghost. More than any passage I've been asked about 1 Corinthians 14. If you want to touch souls and God want, if you want God to use you to give people revelation and understanding. You want God to flow through you in that regard when it comes to the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the essentialities of Acts 2.38. You better get a hold of 1 Corinthians 14 because it's coming up. If you can't explain it, you will lose credibility in the eyes of the people you're teaching. And their pastor will confuse them and they'll walk away from truth. It's your responsibility as a, as a soul winner and a witness. All of us are called to be witnesses. It is our solemn responsibility to be ready to give every man an answer according to the hope that lieth within us. We are the living epistles known and read daily. So you got to get this. Hear what it says in 1 Corinthians 14, 3. For he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification, exhortation, and comfort. You'll see when we get to verse 5 that... Uh, I've already said it, but you'll see it in verse 5 that tongues plus interpretation equals prophesying. The equal. The different manifestations, tongues works with interpretation as it operates amidst the nine gifts of the Spirit. Prophesying just happens. It doesn't need a message of tongues that come forth. An individual, man of God, woman of God, just begins to prophesy, speak, prophesy. But as those things operate, I want you to understand the threefold purpose that's given. Verse 3. He that prophesies speaketh unto men, women, the body of Christ, mankind, to edification, exhortation, and, and comfort. So, I've been in church services before. And um, you can sense, you can feel. I've been in prayer meetings. I've been in small groups. My wife and myself, uh, many different times. My wife, myself, with our boys, many different times, I say humbly, praying in our house. Tongues interpretations come forth. God's used different ones. I've been in different settings, small groups, big groups, church services, otherwise. 
where the message of tongues and interpretation comes forth. Basically, I don't want to get long into discussions here, how it operates, but basically the, the elder or the authority that is in charge yea, of that assembly, that congregation and or that's been given conferred authority that's over that particular service or element of the service. That person's authority. But when God moves, I believe God does everything decently in an order that's biblical. God may not speak everything he's going to do to the person in charge, but he will give them a witness to it. They'll judge, they'll witness, they'll affirm. It's just the way it operates, folks. The gifts of God are subject to the authorities in the church. You can't be subject to the authority that's over you when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit. You do not need to pray that God uses you in the gifts of the Spirit. It will be your demise and your downfall. You have to be subject to the authorities in the church. And with that being said, in the midst of a service, there may be great praise and worship. And then the next thing on the schedule of the agenda, be it the next song or the next uh, thing that takes place, offering a prayer line, a message being preached, whatever, dismissal, everything will just kind of stop. And there'll be a pause. It's like that airplane flying over that airport. It's kind of in that holding pattern. Well, when God's getting ready to speak many times, that will take place. He does speak. I've seen it many, many times. He'll speak randomly and just, it happens. And it just, boom, just, just falls like a lightning bolt. But many times in my observation, you see it differently, so be it. But in my observation, it's like a pause there. And different, uh, seems to me many times, a praying elder here and a praying mother here and a great elder over here and a praying minister here and a woman of God here and even a young child that's sensitive to God, prayerful, they'll feel something and there'll just be a holy hush in the spirit and it's like that holding pattern and, and we're just right there and God's moving, God's been moving, but we don't feel released to go forward and the authority of the church or just a unity and agreement in the spirit will cause a pause. They don't always have to get in the microphone and say, Okay, let's just stay here. Many times the Spirit just sovereignly does that. And then in the midst of that, there'll be, there'll be a manifestation of tongues and interpretation. It may come forth a message of tongues by one person, and that same person may give the interpretation. It may be one person give a message of tongues, and another person gives an interpretation. It may be one person gives a message of tongues. What I'm telling you now is biblical. It may be one person gives a message of tongues, yea, a second person immediately following or sometime thereafter gives a message of tongues. Yea, a third person gives a message of tongues immediately following or sometimes thereafter in that service. And then there's an interpretation. But at the most, three messages of tongues. And then after that, the messages of tongues stops. And we pray for the interpretation. If there's no interpretation, we move the service forward. And God will speak how he wants to speak at some point later. So he can speak after the first message of tongues through that same person that gave the message of tongues or through another person. He can speak after the second message of tongues through the same person that gave the second message or through another person. Or he can speak after the third message of tongues through the same person that gave the third message or through another person. But after the third message of tongues, as the Spirit gives a message of tongues, Spirit gives it, if there's no interpretation, then the authority of the church or the authority that's in charge of the service at that time needs to move the service forward. So with that being said, I've been in services before and a well-meaning person that desires to be used by God stands up and gives what they think is a message of tongues. And you can feel the touch of God upon them, but then the interpretation comes and it's corrective. It maybe sounds something like this. I, the Lord, my God, have come to thee tonight. To reveal that John Smith is in adultery. He needs to repent of his sin tonight. Stop the tape. That's not God. Okay. God's not going to do that. Everything needs to be done decently and in order. I've seen things like this. There'll be a message of tongues. And you'll feel a sincerity upon somebody. They'll give a message of tongues. Speaking in tongues. Behind it. They'll call themselves giving an interpretation. Perhaps it sounds something like this. God, the, the great God of heaven is displeased with the pastor. He's not leading this church the right way. And he's displeased with the church board. And they're not making the right decision. And we need to take the money and do something else with it. Stop the tape. God's not going to speak like that. A word of correction 
will not come. Write it in stone. A word of correction will not come through tongues and interpretation. It will not come through this dimension of prophecy. Okay, now God can use a prophet to send a word of correction. I agree. Don't put words in my mouth. But a word of correction, reproof, will not come through this, this expression of the spiritual gifts. It will come through the authority and the elder of the church. The elder of the church is the word of God is preached and taught. It will come forth, the word of God, the Bible being preached and taught, sound doctrine, will come forth for instruction, for exhortation, edification, for reproof, and for correction. And then there's times that it's done privately. There's times it's done openly. I could teach a long time on that. I'm not going to. So getting back to your Bible, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3. Can you type in verse 3 if, if you're with me? 1 Corinthians 14, 3. Brother Leon, good to see you, buddy. Good to see all you other folks. God bless you. Talking about the third category of tongue speaking in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 12. List all nine of them, verse 8 to 10. We're specifically zeroing in on two of the nine gifts of the Spirit, tongues and interpretation. Tongues and interpretation is talked about in detail, 1 Corinthians 14. I've been teaching now for 35 minutes. If you missed it when this is over, go back and watch it. We continue on, verse 3. Paul says to the Corinthian saints, yea, to the church globally by extension, Paul says that he that, uh, he that prophesies speak unto men to edification exhortation and comfort so when tongues and interpretation comes forth and when prophecy comes forth it should come forth unto edification exhortation and comfort again god uses the office of the prophet the office of the prophet is different than different than the gift of prophecy now a prophet can certainly be used in the spiritual gift of prophecy but the office of a prophet, yes, they correct. But there's a particular qualification for the office of a prophet. It's a unique study for another time. We keep moving. So uh, verse 4, it says 1 Corinthians 14. And let me just, I feel the Holy Ghost here. Let me just speak something. Why is that safeguard in place? That somebody trying to be used in tongues and interpretation, trying to give that message to the church, why is the safeguard of them not correct and put in place? Because if they're not an elder, they don't have the authority to correct. And beyond that, they don't have the understanding to correct. Beyond that, they don't have the heart of a shepherd to correct in that regard. And even when guest ministers that are elders, being an apostle, be a, <clears throat> a prophet, visiting a local assembly, when he stands up and he gives a word of correction, and I release him to do it in the church that I pastor. I do do it. Um, we have had him many times. I release him to do it. But they know that I am measuring them when they do it. I'm measuring the credibility of it. I'm measuring the spirituality that they have when they give it. I'm measuring their spirit. I'm measuring their motives. And I'm measuring if that word aligns with what the Bible says. And I brought them to my office afterwards and I've set them down. I've stepped up in the pulpit when they got done. I I've set them down. I have took the mic from them. And I've set them down and I've corrected the, the word that they shared while they were sitting there looking at me. So that's why. Because these things are subject to the authorities. And you have to be very careful when you begin to wield a rod of correction if you're not an elder. Praise the Lord. Boy, I feel the anointing of a pastor upon me tonight. And, and it continues here in verse 4, 1 Corinthians 14. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. He that speaketh un, in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesied edifieth the church, edifieth the church. You're going you're gonna to find here as we work through this, verse 4, verse 12, verse 16, and verse 17. You're going to see the redundancy of this. Edify the church, edify the church. Edify the church. Does that make sense to you? So, if you want to be used by God in tongues and interpretation, the anchoring point for that is you have to seek to edify, yea, uplift, edify the church. It's not just a, a, a passing comment in a short little statement in one verse. 
It's in verse 3, but it's also in verse 4. It's in verse 12. It's in verse 16. And it's in verse 17. Five times in one chapter, Paul looks at the Corinthian church and says, this is about edifying, 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 edifying. If it's for correction, God sets elders in the church for correction. And that's done a particular way, a particular way. But, but this tongue's interpretation is for edification. I keep moving here. I keep moving. Verse, verse 5, verse 5, um, I've made a couple comments already that tongues plus interpretation equals to prophecy. I get that conclusion. That's not just something I've dreamed of. I heard Billy Cole say that when I was a brand new convert, 20 years old in college, just got the Holy Ghost. Okay, and it stuck with me. He got it because of verse 5. Okay, and I hold on to it not because he said it. I revere him as a great apostle. He's going on to his eternal reward, one of the greatest ever. Um, but I say it because verse 5 teaches it. So it says in verse 5, I would that all speak with tongues. Stop the tape. So any pastor, teacher, uh, whatever denomination, I don't call out names. That's not who I am. If they would ever discourage you from speaking in tongues. Okay, one of two things. They're either a false prophet or secondly, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They may intricately to the depth of the Bible understand some elements of the Bible. But when it comes to speaking in tongues, the spirit and what the Bible says on those things, they don't understand it. Because Paul never, never discourages tongue speaking. He does discourage the misuse and even disorderly use of tongues and interpretation of the gifts of the Spirit. He does discourage that. And he encourages get an understanding of that before you use. But then he says desire spiritual gifts and desire to speak in tongues. So he never discourages speaking in tongues. Continue reading verse 5. I would that you all speak with tongues, but rather that you would prophesy. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. So speak with tongues and interpret. Okay, greater is he that prophesied, except he speak in tongues and interpret. Do you see that? So speaking in tongues and interpret is equal to the great honor that comes upon somebody when they prophesy. So I agree, the distinct different gifts. I agree with that. Before you send me the question, I agree with that. But there, there, there does seem to be a correlation between the end completed work of God's Spirit when His Spirit moves in a body of believers, be it two or more, when tongues and interpretation manifest or when prophecy manifests. At the end of that, the completed work of that is the church is edified. That's the only significance of that. Okay. And again, I want to just emphasize that there seems to be, and it's redundant. It's redundant. That's why I'll be redundant. Um, it, it seems in, in verse 1, verse 4, verse 5, now into verse 6, that there does seem to be a spotlight, at least with the church of Corinth, upon prophesying. Paul is kind of directing them and encouraging them to, to focus upon prophesying. And, and I don't think that's so much um, that we should weight that gift greater than the others. I just think that's where this Corinthian church is at. Clearly, it's a significant gift. But he also says desire earnestly covered the best gift. And he doesn't tell us what the best gift is. So I think that weights them all the same. He says the desire spiritual gifts. I think that weights all nine of them the same. But it does seem that he puts some emphasis upon prophesying with the Corinthian church. We keep moving. Verse 6. Verse 6. This is key. This is key. This is key. You will, you will notice here out of verse 6 comes a theme that I'm going to just hold on to as we get deeper into this chapter. In the verse 16 and the verse 19. Um, it, is, it is when he rises to teach against how the Corinthians are speaking in tongues and how this is manifesting and operating in the Corinthian congregation, it is because it's being done at the wrong times and the wrong ways. And when people are leaving, they have no understanding. Okay, just hold on to that statement. Verse 6, 
Now, brethren, so he's speaking to the church, okay, the congregation of God. Okay, this is directed not at, uh, you have to catch this, not at unbelievers that's never gotten the Holy Ghost, okay? That's not what's being addressed. He's speaking to the church. Can you type in church? I need some help here. So it's a Diane, Sister Sherry, I have your books on my desk at the church. Can you type in uh, church right here? So he's speaking to the church. Now, brethren, that's a reference to the body of Christ. If I come into you speaking with tongues, what shall I proffer you except I shall speak except I shall speak to you in either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine or by doctrine. So he tells them, if I come to you, the preacher, the great apostle comes to you as a congregation and I rise to give a message or give a word as it was done throughout the New Testament. I come to you to read from the scriptures. If I do that and I begin to Mm, speak in tongues as the spirit gives the utterance are the hearers <clears throat> going to get any understanding are they going to receive any revelation no they will not so when you come to the congregation of god hear me hear everything when you come to the congregation as as a teacher trying to communicate hear the words trying to communicate revelation trying to communicate knowledge, trying to communicate doctrine, trying to communicate words of exhortation, the way, the best, most profitable way for me to do that is going to be in the language that they understand it, in the language that they understand it. Consider, if I step to the pulpit, and God has dropped into my heart, into my spirit, a great word for the church. Okay, and I stand and, and I just begin to speak in tongues. As long as, and when it's over, I walk away. Okay, that will probably be anointed. Touch of God will probably be there. I'm not discouraging tongue speaking. But are they going to really profit and get the full substance of understanding, let me use Paul's words, of revelation, of knowledge, of doctrine, of exhortation that they could have gotten, that they would have gotten if I would have spoken the language that they understand. No, they will not. So what he's doing is, he's not teaching against the tongue speaking, but he's teaching when you do it, let yea, two, at the most, three, give a message, spiritual gifts, nine spiritual gifts, Give a message of tongues and then pray that somebody interprets and then move on, move on, move on. The interpretation will be in a language that they understand. It will bring revelation, exhortation. Uh, it will be as prophecy to them, but then move on. And when the word of God comes forth, let it come forth in a language that they understand. Consider, I'm going to come back to verse seven, but, but it's kind of tied together. Paul's like most preachers. We kind of jump around a little bit. Uh, go from verse 6 just to here, verse, verse 16. Okay? Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room? Occupieth the room. Sounds like they're kind of sitting and gathered and they're occupying, they're trying to listen. Occupieth the room. Of the unlearned, say amen at the giving of thanks. Seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest. So the unlearned, either simple, yea, undiscipled, new convert, or even unbeliever. Okay, they've come not to pray in the Spirit, not necessarily to be uplifted by the praying in the Spirit. I don't even understand what that means. I'm a dumb, stupid, heathen, unsaved unbeliever. I've come to hear the Word of God. How shall that person that is occupying that room, say amen, agree with the preacher, give witness to, give affirmation to what's being preached, and I don't even understand it. So Paul is saying, <clears throat> when you rise in the church, in the congregation, in a teaching <clears throat> setting, <clears throat> trying to, <clears throat> excuse me, trying to communicate doctrine, trying to communicate revelation, trying to teach 
the unlearned, the simple, the undiscipled new convert, or even the unbeliever, even the unbeliever, teach in a language that they will understand. That's what he's addressing. Verse 19, same point. Yet in the church, church, verse 19, in, in the church, in the church, somebody say in the church. <clears throat> yeah, please. In, in the church, notice what he says. I'm, I'm taking notes for another lesson. I'm teaching another time. Hallelujah. You're learning. I'm learning. We're all learning together. Verse 19, yet in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice. You got to catch this. If you miss this, you miss this point. That by my voice, I might teach others. Somebody say teach. Can you type it in? Can you type in teach right now? That I might teach others also then 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Go back to verse 7. So, this is the essence of what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 14. I'm going to continue teaching the chapter. I'm not done tonight and we'll finish it next week. But this is the essence of what Paul is saying. When you take verse 6, 16, and 19. Verse 6, 16, and 19. The essence of what he is saying is, First, that when you, when you teach in the church, excuse me, when you teach in the church, you need to teach in such a way that the unlearned, that the brethren, that all those that are in the church will be able to hear and get understanding without respect to how spiritual they are, if they have the spirit or not. When the teaching in the church, that's why it's out of order, when your pastor or a guest minister is preaching and teaching for somebody to stand up and try to give a message of tongues. God is not the author of confusion. If God wants to teach, he's going to use a man of God or a woman of God to rise and to teach a word in such a way where that congregation can learn and understand Revelation, doctrine, exhortation, and such. So Paul says, when I teach, I'm going to teach in a language that they understand. That's the first point, the first main point of 1 Corinthians 14. You have all these different people. He gives them a pretty strong rebuke here as we continue Working through this verse 26, he says, how is it every time you come together, you got a tongue, you got a psalm, you got a revelation. My God, it's mass confusion. Gives them a pretty strong rebuke. So the first kind of point backdrop to 1 Corinthians 14 is that when God wants to communicate something, revelation, doctrine, teaching to the church, it will be done in a language where they understand. That's why he makes a statement that I would rather, verse 19, rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others. That's why that statement is in there. The second element of 1 Corinthians 14, I want to continue working through it, verse 7. The second element is the proper use when the Spirit does move in the church house, yea, beyond the building, in a congregation of believers, two or more, God doesn't need to speak to an individual with tongues and interpretation. You don't find any biblical reference to that. Uh, he can speak directly to you. But I would say in a group of two or more, my conclusion, God can speak to tongues and interpretation. I know he can because he's spoken in prayer meetings between me and my wife. And it was absolutely biblically accurate. So God can speak in a congregation or in a group of two or more. When he moves in that regard to speak to two of the nine gifts of the Spirit, tongues and interpretation, then it must be done in order. Two, at the most, three speak in tongues, and then after that, there's an interpretation. That would be done unto edification, exhortation, and comfort. And that, when it's over, the, the, the completed work of that, the summation of the work of the Spirit, uh, tongues and interpretation is equal to prophecy. That's the two things he's dealing with in 1 Corinthians 14. We continue. I got just a few more minutes. Are you with me here? Can you go to verse 7? Can I have an amen if you're still with me here? I'm still teaching if you're still listening, folks. Verse 7, 1 Corinthians 14. And, and he kind of just illustrates a point here, not to 
not to beat a dead horse, but, but he does seem to uh, emphasize it. And even things without life-giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air, into the air. So that, that's very interesting uh, in verse 9 as well. It's kind of all tied together, of course. And I don't want to re-illustrate it, but you, you get the tone of it, okay? It, it's interesting here as well. Um, remember I said early that there's going to be different points here that relate to intercessory prayer, and then some of it relates to the gift of tongues and interpretation. The latter statement in verse 9 can certainly also apply to the prayer language of the believer, yea, intercessory prayer. Uh, what does the Bible call Satan? Can you can you type in your answer? What does the Bible call Satan in Ephesians 2 and 2? Can you type it in? Ephesians 2 and 2. Uh, the scripture calls him the prince of the power of what? The prince of the power of the air. The air. There it is. There it is. So the Bible calls Satan the prince of the power of the air. It's a long lesson for another time. Well, it's interesting when Lucifer was cast down by Michael to the earth, Luke 10, 18, Jesus said, I beheld Satan fallen as lightning from heaven. He was cast down to the earth. He was given limited, limited conferred latitude or authority. Consider Job's writings, Job 1, 2. He was cast down to the air, that atmosphere. The Bible calls him the prince of the power of the air. He has limited, limited jurisdiction, but he dwells in that place. He's not omnipresent. He's confined to a particular place, but that's where Satan dwells at now. Okay, whenever you begin to pray, you got to hear this. Whenever you begin to pray, and the miller, when you begin to pray in the spirit, um, you are praying into the air. You are literally speaking by the spirit into the air. It's not just in a simple sense, the air right in front of your face. No, it's deeper than that. It is into the atmosphere where Satan thinks um, he can operate. Um, that's why you need to pray in the spirit um, for things that you don't know about. When you feel oppressive things, when you feel strongholds, when you feel the enemy, you need to begin to plead the blood of Jesus, call upon the name of Jesus, declare the word of God, bind the devil, loose the power of God, and pray in the spirit, yea, into the air. It will call a, cause a ripple effect. Um, it's essentially the type of thing, the type of thing that took place as Daniel's praying, speaking words, yea, into the air, might I add. And the angel Michael comes and says, Daniel, I have come in the midst of a 21-day uh, fast. The angel says, I have come, Daniel, for thy words. And what happened to the prince of Persia and then later to the prince of Grecia, those demonic controlling forces uh, working over those municipalities. They fled under the power of God. They fled as the angel Michael came from God. And they also fled, I believe, because Daniel released his voice to speak into the air. You need to go back and study about the power of a shout and a shabak. When you open up your mouth, you begin to speak into the air. We war against the spirits of the atmosphere of the air. So that's that's what he's hitting on right here. Verse 9, many people uh, just perhaps maybe uh, peruse over that, the end of it. For when you speak in tongues, you speak into the air. We continue. Verse 10, verse 10. Uh, it says here in verse 10, there are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification or influence. Verse 11, Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speak a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto, unto me. Unto me. So that just highlights verse 6, verse 9, verse 11, verse 16. It all highlights that, and, and into verse 19, it all highlights 
what Paul says. He is not discouraging them from speaking in tongues, but he's encouraging them. When there's a barbarian, when there's the unlearned, when it's time for doctrine, when it's time for teaching, verse 19, when it's time for teaching others, you should not speak in tongues. That's not what it's for. I understand before you send me the comment or the question, at times people will give forth the message of tongues and people that speak different languages in the world, they've learned it, they'll understand different things. I understand that. I've been around that as well. But the scriptural precedent is that when something's to be taught, it's to be taught in a language that that congregation understands. It's to be taught in a language that the barbarian, that the unlearned, go back and study, I've already taught it tonight, that the unlearned, that the brethren will understand. Okay? And then there's a way for tongues and interpretation to operate in the same setting. But it does not operate when it's time to teach. It's two different diversity. It's a diversity of the spirit. Same spirit, two different giftings, two different manifestations. I'm finishing up right now. I've got my landing gear down. Hallelujah. Verse 12. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to edify the church. Edify the church. I've emphasized this uh, already uh, multiple times. Verse 3, verse 4, verse 5. Verse 12, verse 17, they all emphasize edify the church. We continue reading. Verse 13, wherefore let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. Pray that he may interpret. I want to stop right there at verse 13. And, and we'll pick up next Thursday night at verse 13. And the reason why I'm stopping there is first of all, it's the time I typically stop and I feel led to stop. I feel the anointing lifting a bit. And and beyond that, verse 1 down to verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 14 is really him launching into some specifics now on how God uses people through tongues and interpretation. Verse 13 down to about verse 33, 34 almost exclusively deals with the proper use of of tongues and interpretation in, yea, the ecclesia, the congregation of the church in the body of Christ. And there's different ones on here that's been used by God in that. And I can tell you that God wants to use you in a more significant way. But you need to pray that God gives you some understanding. And you need to be on this lesson next week because there's some things that, that I believe God would have you to understand that you can go higher. Um, if you understand these things and you have submitted your life to God and you do it uh, for God's glory that no flesh would glow in his presence. God will use anybody, any believer that's in the church, God will use them. Um, and I believe that. I believe that. So next week we'll pick up verse 13 and we'll continue teaching first Corinthians 14 next week. And I want to pray here, but just before I pray, let me just encourage you. Um, here we have, we have uh, two new books I want to just mention to you, I'm not here necessarily selling books, but I do want to promote them uh, for your benefit. This is my new book on end time prophecy, the unveiling. Uh, it was just uh, released and it's, it's at the Pentecostal publishing house. Now it's been copyrighted 310 pages and it has an ISBN number barcode, the whole works. And if you want one of those, it deals with the subject of end time prophecy. On that note, tomorrow at 1 p.m., same Facebook page, I will be teaching part two of the lesson on the Antichrist. Watch it live. Watch it archived later. I'll be teaching part two of that lesson tomorrow. And we'll also probably get into a discussion of the false prophet, the second beast. The second book I want to mention in English is available right now on Pentecostal Publishing House's website. You can buy it there tonight, Growing by Grace, A Study of Personal Holiness. It's a 140-page book on uh, your inward consecration and dedications of God. Four lessons on that and three lessons on apostolic distinction, apostolic holiness, modesty, and separation. Three lessons on that. And if you're not a pastor, you need to ask your pastor before you order that book. But it's available through the Pentecostal Publishing House. Anybody can order it, but it's just ethically the right thing to do to ask your pastor before you order it. And um, 
This is the Spanish version of that same book. Spanish version of the same book also. It's copyrighted, has a separate barcode as well. It's also been submitted this week to the Pentecostal Publishing House. If you want my prophecy book of the Spanish version of Growing by Grace, email me, pastordagan at gmail.com. The other English book you can order through Pentecostal Publishing House's website tonight. So I get asked a lot about those books. I'll put it before you. Pray with me. I'm working on right now um, uh, the third uh, book. It is entitled Now Concerning Spiritual Matters, and it covers a pretty broad A to Z look at spiritual things. So it, Lord being our help, will be released later this year. feel a great passion at this point in my ministry. From this age, I'm 48 years old until God takes me to eternity. I breathe my last breath until the rapture to heavily focus upon transmitting what God has put into us, continuing to learn, and then also writing, 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 writing. I feel like God has really called us to do that. So I do cover your prayers deeply. Your encouragement is a great blessing to me. God bless you. I want to pray right now. Can we join you? Can you join me in prayer? Lord Jesus, I thank you, God, for your grace, for your mercy, your love, and your kindness. I would pray, God, touch every person right now. Lord God, strengthen them. Touch their families. Touch their churches. I pray for this church in Mississippi where the building was burnt down. Raise up out of the ashes, God, this great apostolic church. God, thank you for revival. Father, we give you all the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. I love you, friend. I deeply covet your prayers. We're praying for you. We love you. You're on my heart. We're praying for you. Our church is open. Hope Apostolic United Pentecostal Church, Port Charlotte, Florida. HopeApostolicUPC.org. Doors are open Sunday morning, 11 a.m. Hope to see you. Please email me any questions or comments. I don't fuss and fight. But any questions or comments, email me, PastorDagan at gmail.com. Hope to see you tomorrow, 1 p.m. Next Thursday, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. God bless you. I know.